In this week's episode, I am bringing you a conversation that I recently had with um, someone who has been a a friend for quite a long time now, um, kind of moving in the same circles uh, in the in the sensitive, introverted sort of space, creative space over the years. Leah Burkhart. Uh, Leah is the founder of the Healthy Sensitive, where she shares her expertise as a certified health and wellness coach, nutritionist and educator with sensitive people and creatively ambitious people. I really, really enjoyed our conversation and, and found a few topics that, that we covered have really got my mind turning in the weeks since we spoke. Uh, not least the part about uh, balance and integration and boundaries and disintegration. There's something really, really powerful in that area of our discussion that feels important for us to think about and work through with ourselves and with one another as we kind of bring uh, more grace and compassion to the world um, and to our relationship with ourselves and with with each other as we negotiate a a society, a, a culture, a world that, that doesn't switch off and doesn't really want us to switch off either, but also on the same uh, coin blames us for a lack of good boundary setting when we work too hard and suffer from burnout. Uh, really, really interesting topic to think about and one um, that I am probably going to come back to. I'm going to come back to him in, in the extended play episode connected to this podcast on Patreon, uh, as well as I'm sure it's going to be something that comes back again and again um, in, in other things that I'm doing. Um, some other things to listen out for in our conversation are uh, Leah talking about the different types of communication and how getting comfortable with assertive communication as opposed to uh, passive or aggressive or passive aggressive communication uh, is a real gift to ourselves and others when it comes to uh, building healthy balance and, and rhythm into our our lives and and our businesses and our creative um, projects and pursuits as well. Also, the value of uh, mustering up the courage to be disliked. This is something that we've talked about um, a, a few times over the years as well when it comes to making a stronger impact in supporting other people, uh, getting comfortable with the idea uh, that it's not all about people pleasing is a way to make a bigger impact in those in the lives of people that we may be distracted by the desire to please. Also, ways that toxic sensitivity holds us back from um, connecting with who we truly are within, of, of finding that, of, of building a better relationship and a healthy relationship with that part of ourselves. Um, and the dance between business, health and personal health for those of us who are growing businesses and sustainable creativity practices. Um, but, you know, even if you're not doing that, I think there's, there's tons in this conversation that you will, um, you will get some value from. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking now. I'll be back at the end um, to tie things up, to say goodbye. Uh, but in the meantime, do enjoy my conversation with Leah Burkhart. Leah, it is really lovely to be speaking with you again. Welcome back to the Gentle Rebel podcast. Thank you so much. It is so lovely to be speaking with you. I appreciate the time. It's great. Yeah. How have you been? Um, I feel like the uh, we're all in a place where Charles Dickens really ends up being of service here. It's like it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> it was... <laughs> Um, I, you know, when he goes that, that back and forth, it's, yeah, I, I feel yeah. like that's where we're all at, you know, or, uh, there was a song that someone recently played for me where it was, I'm not happy yet, but I'm a whole lot less sad. Oh, that's nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's kind of what I, I better, I think ish. Good. Mm-hmm. Thank maybe <laughs> we're all in a holding pattern. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, summarized yeah what i mean have you have you found anything has gone particularly well or like has opened like the the whole last year has opened up any possibilities in some way for you yes um you know i'm sure you've heard this a lot from folks i almost feel guilty my life didn't change that much Mm -hmm. as a result of the pandemic i'm a pretty introverted person I love people and I love my people, you know, my people in my community, 
And also I really love being able to go home and close the door and recharge. And, uh, you know, so in terms of things that changed in my life, there wasn't much, but I do think having a pass was really lovely. Mm. Like just, just nobody was they outed as being introverted or, you know, or, um, antisocial because everybody had to do it. And so it really allowed me to feel like I got to flourish a little bit in that regard. Yeah. And in terms of insights though, I think the word that comes up is priorities. Right. Yeah. And what's, uh, what was the kind of insight around priorities? <laughs> um, you know, I guess the word simplify comes up. I know we've talked before about minimalism and, you know, I- I'm definitely someone who feels the pull in two different directions. Um, there's I, the analogy I use is one part of me is a wolf howling at the moon. So ambitious, curious, I want growth. I want to try something new. And then there's another part of me that just wants to be slumbering under a willow tree somewhere. Mm. And I think this time really highlighted that for me, the, it magnified the two impulses. So it was much easier to see. So I noticed, for example, I would go after virtual coaching positions that would be, you know, so that I could complement with my work that I do at the hospital. And then very quickly realized, what am I doing? Why am I adding more work during a time when, you know, the bandwidth is already so low. Mm. And so then I'd have to sort of backtrack and then, you know, I'd, I'd go after some other new shiny object. And so it really kind of forced you, given that we were all spending so much time alone, it kind of forces us to look at our own reflection and spend a lot more time with it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I think the, um, definitely resonating with, with what you said about that sort of, um, enforced or the, the kind of pass element of being able to just be yourself and not even feel the pressure to socialize or that, that kind of sense of like, I've got to balance my energy this week with like, social engagements that maybe I've been invited to this and that and it's like no there's none of that it's <laughs> it's really quite refreshing um which now makes it slightly difficult or the the challenge returns as as you know restrictions ease and and everything returns to some sense of normality whatever that kind mm-hmm. of means um but yeah no I, I, and I, we'll get into some of the um yeah those elements of I guess the as you're saying, almost like throwing your hook out and like pursuing those ambitious things and then realizing, oh, what am I doing? I've got already got <laughs> loads on my plate. Um, because, I mean, yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of just talk to you about um, entrepreneurship and and running a business as a, you know, you're the, the, the healthy, you kind of run the healthy sensitive and, and how we hold the personal uh, elements of um, high sensitivity and and healthy sensitivity and also when you're working on your own or working um, you know on kind of entrepreneurial things and in a business how you how you I, I guess nurture a healthy business and nurture a healthy relationship with that business um, so yeah I'm kind of really looking forward to diving into some of that stuff we've had a, a little bit of back and forth uh, before just kind of yeah getting excited about <laughs> what we could talk about so um i think i i was kind of wondering about the the place to start and i thought um motivations is a is kind of a a good jump off point um and maybe just start with like what motivates you in your entrepreneurship and in your business I think the word that comes to my mind is actually growth. So I, you know, and we had talked about how, you know, of course there's the desire to help people. So I'm trained as a coach, uh, a wellness coach, as well as a life coach. And so naturally there's a, a yearning to be of service. And in terms of, but that can manifest in any sort of ways. I, I can be of service as a volunteer. I can be of service as an employee. And so entrepreneurship is something that makes me very uncomfortable because, you know, when you're an employee, you can be the advocate for uh, an employer's policy. 
you can be the defender of their regulations or their protocols. But at the end of the day, if someone doesn't like it, you internally at least get to kind of shrug your shoulders and say, "Ah, above my pay grade. (laughs) Not really. Like, sorry, take it up with the big guy. (laughs) I just work here. Whereas in entrepreneurship, that's, you know, you can't turn around and go like, oh, just hold on, let me get the manager. Like, nope, (laughs) you be the manager. (laughs) So it's an uncomfortable space to hold. And I am terrified of it, but also drawn to it because it's an area where I get to push myself and grow in ways and sort of see aspects of myself I wouldn't otherwise get to see. And so, um, and then of course there is the monetary potential, you know, whereas in a workspace where you get a paycheck that is, it's consistent, but there's a ceiling on some level. Mm -hmm. And in entrepreneurship, the only ceiling is that which you put on yourself and that which the consumer market puts on you. (laughs) But so I think those would be the two biggest elements is the potential for personal growth, as well as the potential for, you know, well, three things, service, growth, and then potentially monetary gain. Mm -hmm. How about Mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of the same. I mean, um, yeah, I really like the the way that you've kind of put that, that you brought that sort of, you talked about the, the self-exploration and personal development being kind of quite intrinsically linked with growing a business. And, you know, it, like there's so many aspects of it that I find very uncomfortable. And, um, you know, we've spoken before again about the expansion of capacity zone. Um, and I know Beth Bilo, um, I really appreciate what she wrote about that and like, like kind of almost letting go of that that notion of expanding your comfort zone and replacing it with this idea of capacity zone um and that's something that i've always held with me in thinking about my business because it's like you you're growing and you're expanding your ability to to cope with different things that that you're kind of dealing with um i guess the the other thing i would maybe say that motivates me is is the kind of the wider aspect of, um, I guess, working with individuals and thinking, okay, the the world changes in positive ways where our culture is, is kind of influenced by individuals. Um, and that, that sort of, I guess, the growth outwards of people with good values, <laughs> um, kind of infecting, so to speak, society. Um, so I think that is, that's a, an element as well. Um, but definitely I think that the one that, that I've worked with most for myself and often find myself working with other people on is the whole, the self bit, the personal motivation. So that the, how is this actually going to help me create like design a life that I want to live in that sort of sense of, and you talked about the monetary gain like that i think that's a hard part for people um yeah and it's i think it, it, it's easy to get it's easy to say like i'm doing it because i want to help people or because i want the world to be better or whatever um but there is also got to be that, that that other part the personal part why is it compelling to you personally yeah well and seeing monetary gain as a Part of making it sustainable, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, I can, I'm nodding vigorously because that monetary part is rough for me because especially if you're, at least in my experience, entrepreneurs tend to go into areas that they're naturally inclined and interested in. Mm-hmm. So they might have a passion for making shoes. <laughs> like, so, you know, like Bill can't remember his last name, but uh, with Nike. Uh, you know, there was some element of interest in that thing. And so there is uh, a tendency for folks in this, wherever they happen to go, whether it's, I'm, I'm, I love coaching. So I'm going to try and be my own coach, be an entrepreneurial coach. There's the willingness, I guess I'll say to do the work, even if not getting paid. And in Mm -hmm. fact, I've noted this with a number of entrepreneurs, even contractors, where it's like, man, I don't want to have to send you the invoice. I'm, I would rather be working. 
like doing an invoice is 30 minutes that I have to take away from an area of my life I'd rather be putting my energy into. So I think there's that element too, where it's like people would be even be willing to do some of this for free. And that's part of what may have drawn them into it. Yeah. And so then to hold up that boundary and say, no, but if I don't ask for payment at some point, this will not be sustainable. Like if I don't eat, there's no me to do the work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's really, that's fun. I'm just, just trying to think the, um, because there's that sort of cliche line, isn't there, of like, what would you do if money were no object or, you know, what would like, what would you do even if you weren't getting paid for it? Um, and it's almost the opposite of that, isn't it? Where you kind of, well, I'm doing it uh, despite the fact that I'm afraid of asking for money or like I, I would, I am doing this anyway. Um, and I suppose I do need to kind of get paid for it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that, that's interesting. I think that's that's so true that when you're passionate about something or you find that thing that really you just want to keep doing, you, you like, you know, I've, I've found it definitely with music as well. Um, where it's like, no, I will be playing music whether I get paid or not. I will be writing songs. Um, and it is the, the side of it that then the kind of admin or the monetizing of it becomes a bit of a pain and it becomes a, yeah, it's definitely not the reason that I do it. <laughs> it yeah. just gets in the way. Yeah. Well, have you ever read uh, Elizabeth Hubbard's book, Big Magic? I have, yes. I, I remember her talking about a number of creatives who don't, like what they have a day job or something that's bringing in the bacon. And then their creative enterprise isn't, at least at first, not the thing that people rely upon to pay the bills. And the impression I got from what she was writing is it almost puts too much pressure on this very uh, potentially fragile thing. You know, creativity can be fragile, especially when beginning the enterprise, sort of like when you grow a plant, you know, that little budding plant, you want to be careful. You don't want to send it into a hurricane. Yeah. And so knowing when it's robust enough to sort of say, okay, now I'm going to rely on this a little bit more to potentially be a source of income. I'm sure there's there's a really good indicator somewhere, but I don't know what that magical switch point is. Like I don't know where that threshold is, where it's okay, not good, not good, and now we're good. So, and whether it's coaching or whether it's you know writing songs, that's a creative arena that you're occupying. So then I I hear you 100 percent where it's like I'd be doing this anyway. So what, how can I justify charging for it? I'm like well, be because food is great and I want to be eating it multiple times a day. And, yeah. you know, exactly. the and it's that there. sustainable thing as well, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's, it's the way to ensure that you're going to be able to do more of it. Yeah. And have more time to do it as well. Yeah. Well, and I also am intrigued by the fact that I got, you know, the more and more you get into, you know, reading about entrepreneurship and from people who do it exceptionally well. And by that, I mean, particularly in the monetary realm, it's sort of, you know, there's, there are a, a number of people who are more willing to pay for a thing if it is more expensive, mm -hmm. which just boggles my mind. So it's almost as though when you as an individual come up and say, no, this is my value. This is what I'm worth. I know that what I have to offer is valuable enough that I have absolutely no qualms with charging this amount of money for it. Yeah. People can sometimes respond with, oh, well, if you think it's that valuable, there's got to be some there there. So maybe I'm willing to fork up the cash versus if you say, no, 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 it's fine. Um, you know, we'll work on it. Well, can you know, whatever you can pay, it's almost, it almost puts the other person in sort of a position of, well, if even you don't think this is valuable, maybe this isn't a valuable expense of my time either. So never mind. It's, it's, very it's really, yeah, it's a really interesting kind of psychological thing of, because there's also the, there's aspects around desire, isn't there within that? Like, and actually desire increases when there's more of a, an obstacle to you getting the thing. So if, <laughs> if you're, uh, so that might be a, a price tag on it it might be i don't know all sorts of things i suppose like scarcity in terms of time so 
like I can say if I'm coaching, yes, I've got, I've, I can only coach this number of people at the moment. So I'll have to put you on a, um, a waiting list. And as soon as it, a spot comes available, then, then you're in. And then that suddenly becomes more desirable because it's not as easy to get hold of. Um, and I mean, that can be manipulated obviously by, <laughs> by people who, you know, we see it all the time in the kind of, I guess, more toxic marketing strategies and stuff, but it's also something worth bearing in mind when we're, when we're having those conversations of like, actually desire is important. Um, and allowing people to desire the thing that you have made because you believe in it, um, is probably quite an important factor as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like exclusivity becomes an attractive feature um, mm. and not in the sense of, <clears throat> you know, we don't want to accept these people, but it's more of there's power in saying, if you want to join this tribe, here's the criteria, like this is who we are. Do you resonate with this? And the more specific and clear you become with regard to, well, this is who I am and this is who I want to serve sort of like when people talk about narrowing your niche, so to speak, yeah. it, there's an a, attractive quality to that because there people do want to be part of a tribe. Mm -hmm. And I think, is, I think, is it Dunbar's number where they talk about, you know, human beings are only really capable of staying in, in true connection with about 150 other humans. Mm, yeah. So there is a desire to feel like I'm a part of something like, Ooh, this is, you know, Oh yeah, I'm part of this club or I'm part of this thing. And I think when marketing is done well, that's what it provides for people is a sense of, oh, that's who you are. Me too. And I now yeah. want to join in that movement. Yeah. And then the thing that helps facilitate the joining might be the product that you're serving. But, and yes, I agree with you. Sometimes it can be used in a really toxic way of, oh, you better hurry because, you know, get it while it's hot or, mm -hmm. oh, there's already been this much interest or there's only this much space. And um, yeah. It's very interesting. And there's, there's, I think someone once said the, the bigger, the tool, the greater the shadow. And that's definitely true with marketing. It can be a great tool, but it's got a hefty shadow. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've not heard that before. That's good. Um, yeah. And I mean, this kind of, I think leads us into boundaries quite, um, effectively as well, you know, kind of we had a, a little in our back and forth kind of talking about bringing boundaries into entrepreneurship and what that looks like. You know, you've got the, I suppose, two sides to it. There's the, there is the kind of the charging part, the expectations between you uh, as, um, you know, entrepreneur and your clients, like what are the expectations, payments, agreements, that kind of stuff. And then there's also personal boundaries for you, like knowing when to stop when to rest, you know, again, it's a, a lifestyle that has, it's kind of infinite. <laughs> There's always more to be done. So it's how you get those boundaries in place um, and, and what those boundaries look like, I suppose. So yeah. What, what kind of uh, thoughts have you got around the different boundaries we need? Uh, well, the first that comes to mind when talking about boundaries between other people is uh, the idea of assertive communication. So yeah. And, you know, the, the classic styles of communication that people talk about, there's passive, which is you matter. I don't. That's the classic. What do you want to do? I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Okay. <laughs> um, I've been in many of those conversations. <laughs> yes. Especially when you're, you know, between introverts or HSPs yeah. for the classic sort of, well, yeah, I'm good. Whatever I don't you mind. Know. I don't mind. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> As I like to say, I'm irritatingly neutral. <laughs> yeah. um, and then there's, of course, aggressive, which is I matter. You don't. So it's like, this is what we're doing. Um, passive aggressive, which is I matter, you don't, but I'm not going to own it. So uh -huh. it's the sure, we'll do whatever you want. We always do anyway. Uh, and then the there's quiet resentment. Like, yes, exactly. That <laughs> feel it like bubbling under the surface. Yeah. And there's the, the, the snake in the grass. <laughs> mm, that's it. And then assertive is I matter and you don't, or excuse me, I matter, you matter. And now let's negotiate and find a way, you know, in the middle. And when, engaging in conversation with people, there are those I've seen who communicate very assertively. And it's like watching someone dance on the ballroom floor. Mm -hmm. It's really elegant. And you know, it's, it's when someone asks for a favor, and the person responds with No, I'm really sorry, I can't do that. 
Yeah. No explanation, no excuses, no, just, no, I, I would love to help you, but I'm in a position where I cannot like, oh man, hmm. can you bottle that? <laughs> and what I find is when I'm being exposed to someone who can communicate assertively, I feel more at ease. And so it's almost like you've got to take that, or at least I have to take that and think about all the different ways that might manifest. So when I'm communicating about payment, the more clear I can be about expectations and how it looks, the easier it will be for the person that's listening to be able to say yes or no. Yep. Versus if I'm wishy-washy with it, sort of, oh, I don't know what, you know, what do you charge? Well, I don't know. What can you pay? It's like, well, mm -hmm. what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Or if I'm too aggressive and sort of like, no, this is how it's done. So there's, there's a middle spot there. So when creating boundaries, in, or as Brittany Brown would say, it's like, what is okay and what is not okay? Mm -hmm. And just being really clear about it. And then in terms of taking that into the personal space, then I have to have that same conversation with myself. What is okay and what's not okay? So it's okay to do X, Y, and Z. But if I go too far, I know myself well enough to know I'm going to have to dial back and it, it'll be, it's sort of like when you talked about the capacity zone. Yeah. And I think what Beth did nicely is she talked about how sort of like a rubber band, if you tug too far too fast, the thing just snaps. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think if I don't hold healthy boundaries with myself, that's in essence what happens. Like I, I got really excited and I went full throttle and pulled too hard too fast. The thing snaps and then it's like, oh no, I've got to start from scratch all over again. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. knowing that sweet spot of, sort of like a workout or, you know, the right kind of burn, mm. you know, just that right kind of place where I'm, I'm pushing enough that it's engaging. And so figuring out where those boundaries are for myself seems like a full-time job. And then being able to take that out and do it effectively with other people. It's like, Oh, that's for me, at least where the work is. Some people are inherently fabulous at it, or at least they appear to be. And I, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> I but I think that that kind of they appear to be is the important part of that um, because you know I, I think uh, to me you probably appear to be good at that and you know just having that awareness and um, that you're kind of t constantly iterating or like working on um, how to be more aware of the boundaries you need for yourself and in constant constantly practicing implementing boundaries in that kind of professional capacity as well it looks like you know you're good at it <laughs> um and so yeah i think almost starting from that place of nobody's ever going to get it perfect like nobody's ever going to be completely delighted with everything that they do in that sense um but it's just that that constant yeah iteration and awareness learning okay what what, what worked well that last time what could I have done differently? And, and that kind of thing is, is quite helpful. Um, but yeah, I think, and that point of actually it doesn't serve the other person at all. And it doesn't serve the partnership. If you are wishy-washy about things like, I guess the, the, the kind of general contract or agreement that you are entering into together in coaching or, or whatever it might be. Um, because you both need to know what's expected, you know, where, what, what do I need to do in order to, to make this happen and stuff like that, as opposed to, right. The other person's just like frightened of asking me for <laughs> what they want. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it, I think that was, you know, it, some people just have these nuggets that are so great and Brene Brown's full of them, but she talks about that word resentment and, you know, as soon as there's resentment, I know there's a boundary that I didn't keep somewhere and that's mm -hmm. on me. And I love that because there are times in my life when I felt that resentment, I'm like, God, I feel like someone's walking all over me. And then I have to pause and go, okay, well, if they're walking all over me, let me check and make sure I don't have a welcome mat out here. Like, yeah. did I put that on my person? And generally speaking, more often than not, yes. <laughs> Most people are not psychopaths. They're, they're just being. Yeah. They're not trying, they're not in it to get you. They're not trying to, they're not out for you. <laughs> they're not gunning for you. 
they're just being. And until you're clear and say, whoa, 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 there was a line and you just crossed it. You know, most people, most of the time, when you say that, in my experience, they back off and go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay, good. Hmm. Now I know. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, thinking about, especially the sorts of people we work with as well, it would be, yeah, they're, they're not gunning for you. They're not, they're not out to get you. Actually, your, your sort of, uh, your niche is very much the opposite of that. So when you experience that resentment, um, you know, and I, I think that's so well put, like that it's on you. Yeah. The, with that moment where you feel like, I can't believe they haven't read my mind. And they, like, yeah. I could probably identify the moment where I had an opportunity to establish some kind of expectation or boundary and I bottled it or I just thought, ah, oh, they'll, they'll get it. <laughs> they'll work it out. And I will say we do get spoiled in our, you know, in our circles, I imagine, because there are a number of people who probably do not read your mind, but you know, That's true. There, there's a lot, a lot of the folks we work with are being extremely attentive. And so it's all and very accommodating and they're, they're out looking for, you know, Hey, how can I, I want to make sure I don't infringe on whatever it is, you know, whatever your boundary might be. I'm going to try and intuitively identify it before you even have to speak it because mm-hmm. I know I really hate having to speak it. And so if you end up spending most of your time with that group of people, it can almost, again, it, you can almost get spoiled. <laughs> That's really true. Yeah. And I get, it's a, I suppose a group of people as well who probably have a more, overt sense of responsibility for things that are not necessarily their <laughs> their doing or their fault so it would be no i should have i should have been more like yeah assertive with asking for something or or whatever rather than they should have so yeah. is there an area you can think of that when thinking about boundaries you feel you're really strong in like maybe you've been working in one particular space and you're just like man when it, if in this context I find that I tend to be able to hold a boundary really well. I don't have any, it, it feels really uh, fluid. That's a very good question. Um, I, d- I don't feel like, <laughs> I don't feel like there is. Like, <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, there are, um, but yeah, coming, trying to, to think of what that, what they, what they are is, is quite, I mean, one I've certainly been working on since kind of qualifying in in my coaching through my coaching diploma is is the whole right establishing quite firm um, kind of packages of of what I offer, and um, I think there would have been a temptation at an earlier stage to to kind of be like, okay, let's customer, let's come up with something bespoke for you, and and we'll work it out completely, you know, on pretty much on your terms um but then i think that that whole idea of that doesn't help the other person it doesn't and it doesn't help you um was quite helpful and and that's that has been really really helpful in terms of yeah establishing a boundary and and letting me know where i stand or the jump off point for me in that um yeah how about you I I can relate where it's just like, is there any one area? Uh, Let's see. Um, I would say the one area that I tend to be best at of the options is probably as it relates to my personal health. Mm -hmm. So as an example, I tend not to schedule very many things late in the evening. I spent an absurd quantity of time in my life struggling with sleep. I can remember having problems with sleep as young as, you know, pretty much as soon as there was enough consciousness that had developed to know that there is a me, okay, to be able to say, I am Leah, and I am a human and all of that. So I would say five or six years old, I can remember having problems with sleep. And it wasn't, you know, I'd go through long stretches where I'd sleep just fine, but it was very easy for it to get knocked off course. And as anyone who's ever had that challenge knows, you know, it always cracks me up when people say, oh, well, maybe it's because of depression. I had to constantly say, no, I'm a happy creature when I get sleep. Mm. <laughs> and it's only when you take that away that I become a depressed moth. <laughs> so, yeah. And so it took the better part of, you know, a couple of decades 
to really fine tune practices so that I could reliably get sleep, which is a game changer as soon as that's available. And so I've gotten much better at uh, knowing for myself when there is uh, that capacity zone is being stretched too thin. Mm-hmm. I'm pushing too far, too hard, such that I'm about to break because I think I've broken that rubber band often enough that I know the warning signs now. And so when it's about my personal health, because I've had I've spent so much time on it, I've gotten better at just saying, yeah, well, here's a boundary. And a really great example is uh, a friend of mine went to, she was having a bridal, sh- not a bridal shower, a uh, bachelorette party at Disneyland. And I was a bridesmaid. So I was invited to go. And naturally that's the right thing to do. And she said, yeah, we're all going to be sleeping in the same hotel room. It's going to be great. It's a suite. It's in the park. And I said, oh, my sweet, sweet little sunflower. <laughs> no. <laughs> and most people, especially in that circle, were delighted because, you know, it's Disneyland and mm. we're going to have fun. I said, oh, dear me, no. I mean, first of all, theme parks are exhausting and exciting, but exhausting. And there's no chance I'm spending the night with six other humans and certainly not six other females. Like, no. Um, and it was hurtful mm. on some level for my friend to kind of hear, well, wait, you don't want to be a part of this. And it was just a boundary. It's like, this isn't negotiable. I need to have a quiet space. And I am a, <laughs> like, I'm a grown woman. I get to have my own hotel room now. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what was your, what was the, kind of contingency for you did you did you just have a room to yourself in that situation yeah because yeah. it's like I know I'm capable of doing the thing that you want me to do like that's a little bit out of my comfort zone to spend that much time with that much stimulation going on all the time but I can lean into that aspect of me that loves novelty and likes to play and that's fine but I need to have some place where I can recharge that battery because that battery is going to be sort of like a smartphone that's been you've been playing podcasts on it and you've been searching and you've been doing zoom calls on it or whatever, Mm -hmm. that battery gets bled out much faster and that's fine. So long as there's an energy source you can tap into. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good example of a, of holding a, a boundary because you've got the, you've, you've got the purpose for having the boundary. You've got the, the thing that is important, which is, you know, being there for your friend, you know, doing, doing that thing, which is, absolutely like integral to that relationship and to your position within that kind of bridal party, whatever. Um, and so it's then having the awareness to think, okay, I am certainly not going to have fun uh, (laughs) if I'm exhausted. Um, how can I make this work for me so that I am able to show up in the way that I need to for the rest of the time? Like what, what are the parts that might need to be compromised um, in order for me to be most effective, I suppose is, um, yeah, which would be sharing a one room with <laughs> a load of people. Is that yeah. that's not the the most important part, probably? Yeah, yeah, or at least it. I certainly would hope not. And yeah. it, and translating that into business, you know, when I see that and sort of figuring, out, okay, so now how do I translate that into the realm of entrepreneurship? I will let you know as soon as I get there, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it is the challenge. So I absolutely hear you hundred percent when it's like, I'm trying to create a coaching program and a package where it's very clear. It's easy to explain. So it would only take a, a short little snippet or sound bite to, I, to say, this is what I do. And this is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. And then feel very solid about, and this is what it costs. Yeah. And then stop. Yeah instead of justifying it or and, and again coming coming to the the customization which would be um you know i, I will go to disneyland I, I just need to have my own room like there's a it's almost like the with the coaching package it's finding the tr- the train tracks along which you're you're moving so that you're both moving in the same direction on the same path and then the customization comes out of that like it's it's not your go i'm feeding you through some you know sausage maker that is the same for every single person that i work with it's like no the this bit is the same and then it's all completely bespoke um from there um the important bits are bespoke these other bits are part of the package 
Yeah, they, they help us get there. Yeah, that is such a great point. It's almost like, you know, especially when thinking about creativity, imagine if you get an art teacher who comes in and says, just produce a thing. I just want you to produce a creative thing. It's like, yeah. well, what do you do? Sculpture, painting, big drawing. I need more information. Yeah. Earth is when a teacher says, here's a blank piece of paper. You all have an eight and a half by 11 blank piece of paper. Uh, you have some paints in front of you and go ahead, go to town. Well, now, yeah, everyone's going to produce something very unique to them, but there's enough of a really clear frame mm -hmm. where it's, Oh, okay, now I now I know what we're doing here. We're good. Yeah. Versus, and while it can sound enticing, like to just say, do whatever you want. We'll make it happen for you because you're a special little snowflake. It's like that. It's almost the paralysis of too many options. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think you you see a lot of businesses working that way of like, you know, customizing. Say you customize a car you've got the frame of you, you you have the car to start with don't you and it's just the some of the features that you get to customize um and then if you really really want to um do things on your own terms i'm sure you can spend a huge amount more money and get something else changed but like yeah that that whole the whole th like you're drawn towards it because it you know the fret you know the shell of the thing and that helps you as a customer um have something to get the foothold in to start with so yeah i know from my perspective as a as a client or a customer i like that when i'm working with other people so but that's a funny thing often the thing i know i like when i'm working with other people i forget when i'm then trying to <laughs> sell something to someone else yeah yep. it's almost like i'm trying to to muster up the courage to be disliked because ultimately what I think it comes down to, I'd love to say that it's because I'm just such a, a altruistic person and I want to be of service. But the reality is probably closer to, it's very uncomfortable to do something that might incur wrath or dislike even from another yeah. person and to hold the line. And so I'd rather just bend and be nimble and be sweet tempered because then how could anyone dislike me? And so my desire to be liked now has superseded the comfort of the other person. And mm. so it, I can make a case for, well, it's just because I'm such a great person. I'm so sensitive and sweet and you just don't get me. And it's like, oh yeah. no, no, I'm just, I, I'm just being kind of selfish. I want to be liked more than I want to help you. That's a good point. Yeah. And there's almost an element that you can, you can turn it around on them as well. <laughs> like it's probably an unconscious well, if you don't, if, if this hasn't worked for you, then that's your own fault because, you know, we did it on your terms. <laughs> yep, exactly. And I, I something I've, I've started to look into, especially with the group that, you know, again, when you say, if I say I generally work with highly sensitive people, especially those that are, you know, again, they're ambitious, but and they want to go after their big dream, but also they don't want to exhaust themselves and figuring mm. out what the sweet spot is, um, you know, Highly sensitive people in particular, I find um, that, every, like I said, everything's got a shadow side. And the shadow side for myself that I've identified, I don't know if this is universal yet. Uh, I call it toxic sensitivity. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's it, when either of these two things manifest, it's one, I'm sensitive and therefore I can't. So I'm mm -hmm. hiding behind a label and saying, see this label thing? I'm almost treating sensitivity like a diagnosis. Yeah. Or... I'm sensitive and that makes me special and you just can't get it. You know, you're less than, Oh, you're a non HSP, which even in the language of some of the books about it, like, Oh, you're one of the non HSPs. You're a normie. I get it. It's like, Whoa. <laughs> so anytime either of those two things start to surface and it's not like I consciously say to myself, Oh, I'm better than you. But if that sort of, experience comes online within me that's usually a sign for myself that's like uh oh i better be careful here because i'm either hiding or i'm trying to say like oh oh you just don't get me yeah. nope it's not their job to read my mind it's my job to speak it yeah yeah that is often the the default response when something goes a little bit wrong well like, you just obviously don't understand you don't get me you don't get me you don't get what i'm really about here <laughs> 
like when you lose something, it's like, who took my keys? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah. like, oh, Always probably. someone else's fault. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I really wanted to, yeah, get into the, you kind of talked about sort of work life balance slash work life integration, which have become kind of obviously during the pandemic, massive things with people working at home and um, I guess being on top of each other as well. Like, you know, people might have been already working at home in in their business or whatever, and then suddenly they find a, a spouse partner is in that same environment. The kids are there, like everything, you know, there is no uh, distinguishing between work and life. Um, yeah. what What's kind of your take on all of that? I mean, there's definitely pros and cons. I, I see the, and there's almost, I've even heard people say they have a, a yearning for work-life integration. And I feel like HSPs in particular have a, a temperament that lends itself well to the potential for that. To, you know, so as an example, I think this is part of why a lot of HSPs have, a, they're drawn to entrepreneurship on some level because they're capable of being wildly productive. And it's like when they get, you know, when their energy is high and they get a good idea and they're excited by it, I I use the analogy of a smartphone all the time, you know, like a flip phone for those of us who even remember, you know, us, there's some youngins who don't even remember life with smartphones, yeah. but, you know, you could dang near like run over the thing and it would still function. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was a beast, but it only had a certain amount of functionality, whereas HSPs are sort of like smartphones. Like they've got a, a lot of functionality, but unlike the flip phone that you could leave uncharged for seven days or more, smartphone, you got to charge that sucker every day mm. it, it, with no exception. Otherwise, you just have the pilot gun. And so because of that, I feel like, you know, HSPs, if they have like a work-life integration model, so it's like I can get up at 6 a.m., and if I have this burst of energy, I can knock out two hours and achieve that which the average person on the average day might have taken five hours to do. But then by 8 a.m., it's like, okay, well, I'm tired. I'm going to, that, that, that was my burst of energy. I'm going to go take a nap mm-hmm. and then go for a walk and then maybe meditate and go to the gym. And then right around 12 p.m. or 1 p.m., it's like, well, now I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, I've got some energy back. Now I'm going to write some things or you know, put something on social media and they'll do that for an hour or so and then leave and then come back. And so if there's a work-life integration model, there's the ability to to work in accordance with whenever their productivity is high, their, like their, their capacity is high. Yeah. Um, but the downside of it is like, the up, it's almost like this. The upside is you can work anytime, anywhere. So go for it. Mm. Downside is you can work anytime, anywhere. So you better be always working. Hmm. And so I think it, the the downside of that, it can be, well, if I can be working, I should be working. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the, that's a really good way of putting it. And that, I think that downside part is probably where we get sort of drawn more towards, isn't it? Like the, the idea of that work-life integration and, um, you know, the, the kind of image of almost like an agricultural life, like working on a farm, you know, and, and the rhythms of the rhythms through the seasons of life kind of comes to mind as a, that would be like a a lovely picture of work-life integration. And, you know, you, you get up and you do whatever you do early, early in the morning, like milk the cows or whatever. Um, And then, uh, you know, you, you, that, that little chunk of work is done and you, you have a, a rest period and whatever that rhythm might look like, you know, obviously you'd be designing it for yourself. Um, but that just does not, that it does not really cut unless you're really good at kind of holding firm to boundaries in that way. Like that does not come to fruition because the temptation is always there because as we said earlier, there is always more to do. Um, yeah. There's always something else you could post on social media. There's always, someone else you could reach out to or engage with in some way. And yeah. And, and even if you're not doing that, the kind of, it's there in your mind, it's there in the back of your head, like, Oh, I could, if, I shouldn't be resting on the, the other things I should be doing. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah, that's, I think the, um, when I, I was kind of reflecting on 
what what we're sort of throwing back and forth and um the the phrase work life disintegration <laughs> came into my head uh, when it came to uh, you'd kind of talked about whether you can go on vacation and you know you, like the 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 fact that you've got your smartphone there and you can fire something off onto your uh, you know business instagram account or business facebook or whatever um and and the fact that you're sharing the sharing of certain personal bits and bobs is a part of your so-called branding or whatever um, within your business and and so that yeah i think the it's almost the disintegration of of boundary of the boundaries between things um which can obviously have then an impact on other parts of your life, life like important relationships and things and and your ability to truly you know i miss the days of going on vacation and not just completely switching off not having any idea what the news was like i remember we used to go on holiday as kids two weeks so we'd go from sort of england to france or whatever um and you wouldn't see a newspaper you wouldn't hear the radio you wouldn't have any clue what's going on anywhere and not only that that made the holiday feel a lot longer it made it feel more refreshing um and it just yeah I, it, there was just something really beautiful about it well then you you said beautifully when you were talking about the the idea of like the sort of the agricultural life where there's a lot of there's a bit of work-life integration there but there's much like the difference between me Leah as employee and me, Leah as entrepreneur. As an employee, there are boundaries that the institution I'm working within is holding up for me. Yeah. And I think that's probably true with agricultural life. Like the environment was holding up a boundary for them. You legitimately yes. can't do Good certain point. things once it gets dark. I mean, I suppose you could bring a flashlight and milk the cow at midnight if you were really ambitious, but and even then you have to adhere to the circadian rhythm of the cow. So mm. It's almost like you don't have to, the risk of work-life disintegration is much lower because you're, the boundaries ex- outside of you are still maintained on some level versus now where, yeah, you, we have this technology where you 3 a.m. you can pull out your phone and someone somewhere will be awake and potentially could respond to you. Mm. And someone somewhere is awake doing work and hustling I'm putting in quotation marks (laughs) and it's like well if you start to get into that particular rat race it's like there's always someone that's going to be going faster than you and Mm. you've got to keep up there's that's the mentality that can come online and yeah it used to be when we go on vacation there was an external boundary because you just legitimately didn't have access to your phone your phone is at home you can't and even if you have pull up your cell phone if you left the country your service may have disconnected. I mean, I remember I was what, 22, 23, and I traveled to Ireland for a holiday and I had a cell phone, but I couldn't use it as soon as I left the US. I mean, I suppose mm. I could have, but the service was just severed. Versus now, if I travel anywhere outside of the US, I could still access wireless and connect with people on Facebook. And so it really is all on us to create those boundaries there's no lean on any external element that's a really good point yeah yeah i love how you've you've put that with that sort of agricultural metaphor and and then yeah that the fact that it's it's all personal responsibility when it comes to creating boundaries and not only is it personal responsibility but on the flip side of that is this pressure to be hustling to be keeping up you know and that that constant anxiety that's just there about well if i if i like take my foot off the gas now i'm gonna fall behind and other people are gonna get ahead of me and and that that combination is such a well a toxic recipe like yeah and and the idea that because obviously there are apps and there are features in apps that allow you to, you know, turn them off or like you can put airplane mode on or whatever it is, but it's always down to you. It's always like your own, like, and you, you can't win because <laughs> either you're expected to be turned on um, and like integrated into things or 
if you burn yourself out people will be like well why did you allow yourself to do that like there's there are ways to you know <laughs> didn't you didn't you watch that latest webinar on burnout and all and positive psychology and all that like didn't you see that latest ted talk that talked about how important it is not to burn yourself out what's wrong exactly, with you exactly yeah oh man i think i'm gonna be uh, <laughs> reflecting on this one quite a lot that's really cool. Yeah. And I mean, I just got sort of a few minutes left, but I re really wanted to just go into the, uh, like we obviously talked about health and the idea of business health and how that relates to personal health. I, I think you, you'd kind of asked the question of um, when, uh, like when, biz when the business feels healthy, does that have an impact on our personal health? Um, and vice versa i suppose so where do you see that as a thing that comes together currently i hope this changes um because currently as it stands for me to get my business health you know sort of to feed the business health i generally find that i'm having to give up some of my personal and physical health right and so it's a it's sort of like looking at a balancing beam and there's business health on one side and there's my personal health on the other. And I'm just trying to balance the two. Mm -hmm. uh, I know people though, who say that their personal health improves alongside their business health, which I think is fabulous. Uh, when I figure, when I hack that particular algorithm, I will let you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, and I think some of it has to do with the level of um, beginner's mind I'm in as it relates to entrepreneurship. So it's almost it's sort of like that stages of uh, competence. So there's unconscious incompetence. I don't know what I don't know. And then conscious incompetence. At least I'm smart enough to know how dumb I am. <laughs> and then there's conscious competence and then unconscious competence. And maybe when you get so sort of into a groove with entrepreneurship, the two are complementary. Um, but I'm probably somewhere between conscious incompetence and conscious competence where it's like i'm smart enough to know get it get, i'm getting better at asking the right questions yeah. but that doesn't mean that it's just flowing mm -hmm. and um so i don't know is it for you is it similar do you, do you is it a two things on a balancing beam or yeah, are they well, I, I, th I was i just thought um i've had moments of, I, I guess it it's almost like a not boom and bust but like ebbs and flows of um because i was just thinking when i launched my um return to serenity island course back in march like it had a really nice launch and things were going really really well and that gave me a boost in terms of like yes great like i'm i'm almost kind of walking on sunshine so to speak and and that really had a positive impact on my on my personal health and and just things felt lighter and i was able to like move along really nicely um and then as that sort of tailed off the the kind of stodginess returned a little bit and and so it was, it's almost like okay i need to there almost needs to be more of that balance beam where it's it's kind of oscillating in, in a more healthy way rather than big highs and or, or like i don't know boosts and then little crashes not at this that extreme like <laughs> that comes across as like massive but <laughs> i 100 percent get it and i there's as you were speaking I, there have been times in my life where i can identify with that where it's whether it's a class that i've designed and people have had positive results from it or they their people have come in it's like whew, there is a high and yeah. so it's almost like what you're getting at the heart of is how do i fall in, so much in love with the process that the outcome has less and less of an impact one way or the other. It's like, yeah, if they, people love it and there's in it, it's a great launch, then great. But that's not the thing that's riding the high. It's almost like the process itself and the work itself is so juicy that that's the thing feeding you as opposed to, no, I'm doing this thing and it's, it's requires energy, but man, when I see the outcome of it, it can sometimes give me a high. Yeah. That's uh, it. That's it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess to come sort of full circle to almost where we started is that that idea of sustainability again as well. Like it comes to mind of the those those kinds of I guess those ebbs and flows that come through 
if you're launching things and um you know however you sort of work whatever your business model is like for me it's probably going to be that sort of yeah thing there's moments of launch and um and then moments where that tails off but if that's kind of moving i guess nicely sort of oscillating through that then enables the sustainability of I guess the rhythms of of the work, the the kind of general day to day work. So everything has a has a nice sustainable rhythm, um, in conjunction with that w- awareness that we've talked about of of the boundaries that we need and and ensuring that yeah, it's not work, you know, burn the candle at both ends to keep the candle burning. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's sort of like going to the gym and working out. You know, it, it's. At first, every time you go to the gym is legitimately painful and just burns energy. And you know that at some point it's going to feel great. And then there's a a threshold that's breached where suddenly going to the gym has pull and you don't actually care. It's sort of like when you're like, if you're trying to lose weight as an example, oh, I got on the scale and it felt really good because I'm losing weight. And so that gives me even more energy to keep doing the thing. That's it. But at a certain point, there's almost this threshold that gets breached where the exercise itself becomes the reward Mm -hmm. and the weight is almost superfluous. It's just like, I don't really care that much what happened to the scale. I'm just in it for the high of the doing itself. And just like you're talking about sustainability, that doesn't mean there's ever a point where you should go four or five hours, unless you're an Olympian. But you know, if you go to the gym and just really crush your body to smithereens, it's still going to be unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, but if you can find that balance, that becomes a source of energy in and of itself, irrespective of what happens as a result. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and it's I suppose it's that moving along to to find that that balance and that sustainability, as opposed to getting all of your all of your meaning from what that scale says when you get on it, because that you'll just replace that with something else that then could become this this constant external measurement that you're striving after that can take you down quite sort of, I guess, unhealthy growth, kind of an unhealthy relationship with, with measures of growth um, that are never attainable because there'll always be something yeah, well, more extreme. Yeah. Never be too rich or too thin as they say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Um, well, I mean, that hour has gone so fast. Thank you so much for uh, for hanging out. We'll we will definitely have to do this again and finish the conversation because there's so much more to talk about. Um, but before we go, is there somewhere that uh, you'd like to kind of point people towards? Sure. Yeah. So if anyone's interested in the work that I do, uh, my website is uh, www.thehealthysensitive.com. And so once you get there, you can pretty much navigate to whatever is of interest, whether it's my podcast or my blog or the online community that I do or coaching. Fabulous. Cool. Well, thank you, Leah. Thank you. This was fabulous. Thank you so much for your time. It was a joy. So there we go. A massive thank you to Leah for that conversation. It's, it's always such a joy to speak uh, to speak with Leah Burkhart. And, and I hope that that joy found its way to you as well. There's something about the conversation just sort of flows and um, the exploration of, of different things, things that were not on my list of uh, topics to talk about. But yeah, it, it was a really fascinating discussion. And one, as I say, I've been kind of ruminating on many facets of it. Uh, since we recorded it Um, and when I went back through to edit it um, not that it it didn't actually need much editing but I made sort of four or five pages of of notes to uh, to reflect on Um, and that idea of external limitations and restrictions was was something that I think I found particularly fascinating you know that idea that um, there are things uh, that things that we would have had you know in in years gone by that would enable us to stop um, external things that mean that we cannot physically do any more and how technology is now making it possible to do more and more and to engage with that sense that 
there is always an opportunity to add a little bit extra um, and how that can be a positive thing in some respects, but it can also be a source of great um, overwhelm and potential burnout as well, because that nagging feeling that oh, I'm missing out or there's something else that I should be doing. And then the flip side of that, um, which is the sense that boundaries have to be implemented through personal responsibility. So it's up to us to to put those limits in place for ourselves. Um, and when you've got that message of um, there's always more to be doing, there's always, you know, like success is dependent on your hard work and all of those messages. On the flip side of that, the idea of your own health is your responsibility. You need to make sure that you've got solid boundaries in place in order not to burn out and, and to get completely overwhelmed. Like those two things, it's a, it's a very fine tightrope. And I think, yeah, like being aware of that tension and being aware of that pressure um, is really important for ourselves and also in the way that we hold one another um, and yeah, in a sense, hold that the feeling of of competition and so many of the you know we when we compare ourselves with one another, like there are so many ways that we get caught up in that in that endless treadmill of trying to keep up and perpetuating that the the kind of the speed and the momentum of that um, and the perception that you know if I stop, then everyone else will get ahead of me but in not stopping in not being healthy uh, in the way that we put boundaries into our own lives we're actually perpetuating it by giving the perception to other people that they need to keep up with us um and so you know this is not something that i've yet come up with any solid um <laughs> solid sort of answers for because i i'm not satisfied with the suggestion that it is a purely personal responsibility thing because I think that is unfair. I think it's a it's a pressure that we put on ourselves or put onto other people um, that is not looking at the source of the of the problem. It's not looking at the true source of the solution either. I don't think personal responsibility is a satisfactory solution to this whole thing. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know what the right answer is. I'm actually going to hop on to Patreon and, and kind of expand a little bit more on this. Um, so, yeah, and, and uh, there's a couple of other parts of our conversation that I'd love to expand on as well. Um, so, yeah, basically what I do on Patreon is I share um, all sorts of things. Like if you want more songs, personal stories, unscripted, um, philosophical fun and nonsense, then patreon.com forward slash Andy Mort to get access to all of the extra stuff that I put out on the uh, the private podcast feed there, um, plus other bonus treats, new music, conversations about creativity, about life, about uh, challenges that we are facing in the world right now uh, together, um, maybe, and, and things like this, which I think is one of the challenges that we're facing in the world right now. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's my hope through that um, well, through this podcast and through the private um, podcast that you'll feel a bit more connected to me, uh, a bit more connected to other people there um, and, and just less alone in some way. I can't promise uh, solid answers to things, but I think, you know, most of this is just about talking about stuff like this, about, you know, acknowledging the, I guess, the, the fears and the the feelings and the anxieties that come with the stuff that we we uh, chat about in that interview um and just acknowledging the fact that this is a shared experience it's a shared feeling um and yeah hopefully that makes you feel less alone in some way so yeah patreon.com forward slash andy mott for more information about uh, about the private podcast extended play um there okay i think that is all i have to say this week um so just leaves me to uh, say that i'll be back again next time with another episode of the gentle rebel podcast until then do remember that you are an artist that the world needs your art now go and make somebody's day
Bye-bye.